Hey all, it's Chris from Attraction Source and thanks for joining us to look back on the question and answer session with John Burton, creative lead designer at Merlin Magic Making. John's appearance was part of the Towers Time Summer Festival event at Alton Towers on August the 12th, 2023. And if you would like to attend an event like this where we feature various industry professionals, then there's a link in the description below to our website. John has been with Merlin Entertainments for seven years and in this time has been responsible for developing creative concepts behind new attractions, shows, events across Merlin's resort theme park estate. His most recent projects include the Cursor Alton Manor and World of Jumanji. His passion for the industry goes back even further than this and this Q&A provides a great opportunity to get to know him better and you'll hear answers to questions such as what it has been like to work with industry legend John Wardley and his thoughts on the up and coming project horizon at Alton Towers. We managed to find out a few things about John that haven't made it to his LinkedIn profile so I'll now hand you over to Lewis on the night to tell you more. obsessed with board posters and as it seems to be a rite of passage for many enthusiasts including publishing video, uh, YouTube videos of his creations in Rock Coaster Tycoon. Uh, John apparently at one point held the record for the most continuous rides uh, on Space Mountain in Hong Kong Disneyland and after winning a competition John was one of the first people to ride 13 and this was actually when he first crossed paths with John Wardley. Apparently he even got his mum to drive him to Alton Towers just so he could film by the entrance sign and incorporate this into a video of him Friday 30 before it's actually opening as part of his competition. And finally, John's first job at Merlin was actually at Sea Lab Centre Birmingham whilst at university. Now the surprising detail about this is this was actually despite having a fear of crabs. <laughs> so, without further ado, please put your hands together and welcome John Berkeley. So before we start, you're probably wondering um, who the source of our information was. Um, well, back when we launched uh, the event, uh, we received an email from John's dad, Paul. Oh. <laughs> uh, his hope was to attend this evening, um, completely unbeknownst to John, and surprise him by asking a question tonight. Um, as he can't be here, he did still want to make an alternative contribution, uh, hence we'll just find out. Um, but that also did also remind you and take this opportunity uh, to remind you that in your mum have uh, the close to credit cycle at Luna Park. Uh, in, 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 uh, one, of the old, one of the oldest really roller coasters in the world, if anyone doesn't know. Um, and John missed out on this whilst visiting New York as part of the university trip. So there we go. But to be sincere for a moment, um, from our interactions with the dad in the run up to the event, it has been evident how proud he is of what you've achieved um, in your career so far. Doing this Q and A this evening. Thank you. <laughs> so, before we open up to questions uh, from the floor, we thought we'd warm up uh, with a few questions of our own. With you, this being your first time speaking at an event like this, perhaps you'd like to start by taking us through key points in your career so far and reaching your current role at Creative Lead at Modern Magic Making. Sure. So, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for inviting me here today. I don't know what's more nerve-wracking, um, sitting here with over 150 enthusiasts who are waiting me, for me to spill uh, what's going on behind David Walliams with the wacky worm, uh, <laughs> or if trying to get the CEO to get an RMC at Merlin Park. I don't know which one's more nerve-wracking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you, it's amazing you've got all that information. But um, yeah, so for a bit of um, context, my interest in theme parks started when I was much younger. I was able to go to theme parks, Alton Towers uh, being my home theme park, I went to Disney World quite a bit, and I got massively into the game Roller Coaster Tycoon. I don't know if everyone's played that before, no, I'm not sure. Um, I got completely hooked. And when Roller Coaster Tycoon 3 came out, that's when I started creating custom content with all 3D modelling, which I have to give it to uh, Frontier for kind of allowing that to happen because that to me actually helped build my portfolio in 3D model making, um, helped me get into what essentially is this, this job um, here today. Um, like you said, I went to university and studied architecture. It's the thing I get asked quite a lot, how do I get into this, this business? 
Um, architecture for me is one of those courses that kind of gives you an opportunity to kind of learn a bit about everything. You're not a master of anything in particular. Um, by doing that, I also wanted to get experience within this industry. And I went to Birmingham, so it kind of was a bit of a no-brainer to go work at the Sea Life Centre. Um, I was there doing talks uh, all about the animals, doing the feeds, and um, some of you may know that I've talked about it that I actually ended up being a sheep in a costume um, at the Sea Life Centre as well, which is kind of bonkers. Everyone goes, "Why is there a sheep?" It was some IP deal that did with timid sheep there, um, and I was having to dress up as it and run around um, for a year and a half there. Um, but that was really a great experience because actually a lot of people I worked with there um, are still within Merlin and I still work with those guys today. Um, and when I was studying architecture, I don't know if anyone knows about architecture, it's a really long course, it's about seven years altogether, and you have to do kind of breaks and go get the experience working in industry. So I went and worked for a company called Leisure Concepts, which is in Kenilworth, and they primarily work in the industry, the leisure industry, um, it's in the name. And they work with Haven, Butlins, Forest Holidays. And I started working in the architecture department there, working on some of the Haven parks, a lot of the water parks they were doing at the time. They didn't have any work with Merlin uh, at that point, but they did do some of the original stuff with Safari, and that's kind of why I kind of got uh, resonated to go work with those, those guys. And there was one colleague in particular who was kind of really passionate, because they knew I really wanted to get a job working in this industry. And they said to me, um, it was a quote from Walt Disney, I had a little plaque which was, all your dreams can come true if you have the courage to pursue it. And I use that as my motto all the way through to this point I'm now here today, um, being able to speak to you guys uh, about all of this. Um, after doing my part two of architecture, it then became that this job went live. It was a creative role at Merlin Magic Making, I thought, this is, this is fate, and I had to apply for it. Um, I graduated then in the March, and it then took around six months of um, interviews, projects, uh, tests, and all sorts that we had to go through to actually um, get to the point where I actually started my job uh, around the end of August um, with murder management making. And from there, the structure of the team has changed over the years. So I began working with Merlin, working on Thorpe Park and Warwick Castle. They were my two first uh, attractions we were assigned to. It was one creative lead or creative assigned to two attractions at the time. Um, and I got first projects where I got given was uh, Wars of the Roses at uh, Warwick Castle and then um, Walking Dead the Ride as well uh, for that. And then over time, where people have moved, the structure has changed, and over time, I've then my remit kind of expanded. I became a creative lead at Merlin over the last seven years, and um, I've been basically covering most of the resort theme parks. And if I say RTP, that's resort theme parks um, for it as well. Thank you very much. So that brings us right up to this year, and obviously, this season's principal new addition here at Alton Towers has been the Curse at Alton Manor. So can you give us an insight into when plans for the overall duel first started to be worked up and how they developed kind of over the course of the creative and construction process? Sure, so with Alton Manor, um, I didn't actually start the project when the first brief originally came out. I was very much needy in Italy working on Gardland's um, Comanche the Adventure. And at the time I was kind of speaking with my colleagues back in uh, the London offices and just speaking with them about uh, what was going on, what concepts, and you saw some of those things from Larry today, they were working on some of those move boards and ideas, um, which some of them were testing well, but some of them weren't testing too well at the time. Um, and when basically I'd handed over the project for Jumanji the Adventure, I came back and they said we needed to come up with some more ideas, because some of these just weren't landing at the time. So I stepped in and me and my colleague, uh, I remember at the time we were on Zoom, I say in my kitchen, and we were trying to kind of um, brainstorm these ideas of what we could do and as a, an enthusiast myself I wanted to really tap into some of the nostalgia of um, the original haunted house um, so that's at the time I was also speaking with John, John Wardley um, and also reading a lot more into the haunted house and also I grew up with it and I've, there were certain elements of it that I really were passionate about keeping and building from and it was something that film is doing our industry is so similar to the film industry so for me and my colleague, we saw the Emily Alton um, figure as our kind of key and a hook for it in the creative. 
Um, and in the research that Larry does, some of the words that come out from that is people always referenced the doll, uh, the little girl in the doll's house. And so that for us was that was the bit that was the golden nugget that we wanted to to build from. And just kind of rewinding again about the idea of the doll's house element. When we were working on the, the concept, I harped back to when I first went to Walton Tower as a child. And I remember when I was, I must have been about so six or seven, and I went on the original haunted house attraction. And I got home and I was so kind of taken by it. I remember getting my Tony Thomas the Tank trains, getting a slinky for the Trommel Tunnel and making the other haunted house attraction. And for me, that was like, oh my goodness, imagine making this as if you are in a doll's house and this is you going around. And that's kind of, again, where that kind of nugget of an idea came from. And we started designing this whole attraction based on um, Emily Alton as well. Thank you. Um, obviously, one of the things I think many people noticed about your attractions that you design are kind of the Easter eggs you work into them. And uh, obviously, Castle Water Manor is certainly not short on, on short on them. So, what is your favourite Easter egg in uh, Castle Water Manor? That's a great question. So, there's so many in that attraction. I think every single scene has got something. It's not like I just throw them in there for the sake. Normally, it's because when we're designing the attraction, there is. We want to put something in there, whether that's a clock, and we go, well, we're going to custom make that, so we might as well add some reference and, um, to it, because we know we've got different levels of um, engagement with our guests. Uh, we call them level one guests to be someone who might just, all they care about is the hardware, they don't care about story, um, all they want to do is go experience the physical feeling of what it's giving them. Uh, level two, you know, a guest would be someone who would, they, they get there's a, a bit of a theme to it, Level three is someone who really gets into that story, and that's usually where we really try and target where we're trying to go with our attractions. And then level four is us, all of us in this room. We get into that detail. We really want to really delve deep into that story. And Alton Manor gave us so much opportunity to do just that. Now, I know on my like, social channels, on Merlin, we've posted and talked about some of them. You guys have done videos on some of the Easter eggs that are in there. But there are a few that people haven't yet spotted but I said I would probably try and bring some of those out today so you can account for those. And I think my favourite and ultimate Easter egg that I don't think anyone has spotted yet is, it's a bit like what they're doing in film, that the mom of Emily Alton that is in the attraction is the original Emily who was actually in the original Doll's House that we went and found and found her dad, found her, and we brought her back um, and cast her as the mom so she could reprise her role within the attraction as well. So we never lost the original Emily Alton. That is a fantastic <laughs> And just sticking with the Castle Autumn for just one more question. With the Dark Ride, it's often said uh, that it's never completely finished, and over the five months it's been open, we've of course seen sort of additional effects added and enhancements made. Um, can we expect to see anything further sort of added to the attraction? <laughs> so, what I can say is that as a uh, Merlin Entertainment, we're always looking to drive that kind of guest experience, always looking to improve and enhance um, the attractions. With Alton Manor, yeah, you've seen those improvements over time as we keep playing with it, tweaking it. Like you say, dark rides are constantly um, having to be adjusted um, based on the guest feedback. Um, definitely have heard the comments about dark spots in, in there. Um, but yeah, we're constantly looking at it and reviewing it. Okay, thank you. Um, this time last year we were joined by John Wardley, um, where he revealed that he was sort of once again involved with upcoming projects at the resort. Uh, we now know these have included the Curse of Alter Manor, uh, alongside the ongoing refurbishment of Nemesis, and of course the mysterious Project Horizon. And what has it been like working with John on these projects? And in respect of the Curse of Alter Manor, is there anything specific you're giving credit as having been added or altered in the attraction as a result of his input? I mean, it was an, it was an honour to work with John. I mean, I looked up to John as an enthusiast when I was younger, growing up. Like you said, and you found out that I met John for the first time at the 13 boot camp where I was able to uh, meet him in the hotel and show him some of the creations I created. 13 in 3D digital and sent him a DVD at the time of it and he wrote back about it. Um, but John is a font of all knowledge. He's, he's just he's an amazing person and he's always so passionate to still keep and get involved with the projects. Um, first time from a kind of 
professional point of view, I ended up working with him as I remember it was a Zoom call, I was at Warwick Castle and we were talking about the potential that Nemeth, what was happening with Nemesis. At the time we didn't know what was going to happen with it. There was this talk, as Larry said today, um, around it reaching the end of its kind of serviceable life and we had a few ideas at MM what we would do with that and I remember just sitting on a Zoom call pitching some of these ideas to John and he's super enthusiastic and super passionate about what we do at MMM Creative. Um, and then again, the same thing happened with Alton Manor. There were certain things we needed to do to it. And John was, again, font of all knowledge and would bring that to the, the project. Um, as the creative lead on the project, it was really good to have him as a sounding board. Um, you probably heard this in the newspaper articles and tried to go with that with more classic, traditional Victorian effects with the amplification, amplification of new modern technology on top of that. And there were certain effects in there that John was like super enthralled by uh, that we were doing the Pepper's Ghost, um, vanishing Emily on the swing. He said that was one of his favourite uh, effects that we were able to add into there. Um, and John, I'd bring him in at various moments and just share with him what we were doing. Um, he'd have his input uh, about certain elements, things that had he tried before and maybe hadn't quite worked. Um, in the ghost corridor, I don't know if anyone is, knows the attraction in that great detail, but when there used to be the, the, the spirit ghost that used to be on the road coaster kind of track, which was all, was all still in there, we talked about how can we create that Emily Alton gag where um, that whole scene is resetting, because that was the same challenges that they faced back there, with, um, but we were having to try and do it in a different way, but uh, technology allowed us to do that, which they couldn't have done uh, back then. And I just remember towards the, the last week, just before the opening, um, John actually came and stayed in the hotel and he was up for doing anything. He was picking up a broom, he, you name it, he was there on the ground with us, um, getting it all ready and, and finessed, ready for opening as well. That's great. Um, so, looking to the future, based on just what we're aware of being in the pipeline of Winston Towers, the next few years do look to be exciting for the resort. Um, now, we know you can't really tell us anything about Project Horizon and what would be in the big box quite at this stage. But if we asked you to give us just one word this evening, what would that be? I was going to say wacky, but it's giving too much away, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I was going to say um, one word, captivating. There we go. Well, we look forward to seeing the speculation that fuels over the next few years. Um, so thanks, John, for getting started with those questions. Um, it's now time to open it up to the floor. Um, so we'll, if you do have a question for John, put your hands up, and we'll, myself and Chris will be around with microphones to take them. And we'll leave it to you, John, to pick them up. Thank you. Please be kind. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the first hand shoot up there. <laughs> What would you say to a budding 10-year-old who designs roller coasters? I would say I was very similar. I was 10 years old designing roller coasters and for me it was just keep that passion, keep going, let it shine because this industry thrives on people with passion that really make it what it is. And as you grow up, as you get older, build a portfolio, really amplify everything you do, learn as much as you can. I mean, I learned so much from Roller Coaster Tycoon. Um, my parents were driven mad by how much time I wanted to be on that computer game, but it did really help me. Help me. Um, and try and, when, when you can, get experience, whether that's working in, uh, I don't know, costume character like I did, all of it added up. And when I, my final portfolio was um, a small document that showcased so much of what I wanted to do. Um, and that's what they were looking for. They were looking for someone who was well-rounded because the job of a creative lead, for instance, is it's not sitting there drawing things out. It's about how you art direct. It's about how you kind of choreograph what's happening and what I, we call it orchestrating the show, essentially. So it's having just such a broad skill set, um, is what I'd say. Next one. Can we run, John? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, what are, do you think are the top three qualities that make up a great dark ride? That's a really difficult question. <laughs> 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 I'm the type of person who likes to think about answers, so on the spot questions it is quite difficult. Um, 
I think a really great finale is, is really important because with a, any, I think that's for any ride, not just a dark ride, because the last memorable moment you want to go and take away is how it made you feel at the very end, which is why on something like Curse, we were, that was actually where we started when we designed the attraction, was the finale, and we worked backwards, working through some of the scenes we knew we wanted to keep, and then what we did was glued those together with the transition pieces all the way through. So I'd say the finale is, is the first piece. Um, I think the story that really holds it together is super important. We want guests to feel that escapism that we talk about a lot here at Alton Towers now. Um, we want them to really feel part of that. Um, I, I'm really mixed when it comes to interactivity on dark rides. Um, I know that there's a big push at one point, like Jewel, add interactivity, add shooting on there, that passive attractions um, are not a done thing anymore. I do really think that actually it's theatre at the end of the day. We are putting you into that ride like a theatre show, but you're on a moving vehicle and you're now part of it. So I don't see it as completely passive, um, which is why, because there were a lot of discussions about Ultraman, about do we make it interactive in any particular way. Gangster Rally was exactly the same, do we make it interactive? Um, so that, I think, is another, another one, storytelling. Um, and then the third one, I think it's just all those felt effects, which kind of taps into that uh, second point. Things that do, you make you feel something, whether that's air jets, whether that's the noises, it's just making you feel like a part of something uh, and, not, um, and not just sitting back and just watching. Thank you. So the band here. Hi, so um, something I noticed is with a lot of rides that you've actually been a part of, there are so many photo opportunities, like with the world of Jumanji, you've got like the main set piece, and from the entrance and different parts, like the Mandrel Mayhem sign and things, you can see directly to obviously like, I don't know what you call it, I haven't seen Jumanji, but I love the ride. <laughs> I love Mandrel Mayhem anyway. Um, is that something you kind of really think about to promote like advertising for the park or things, or is that just something that kind of happens like coincidentally? Everything is planned, everything is thought through. So, um, you, if you any of you watch any like Imagineering videos or anything like that, it's there's kind of some real key design principles that um, designers of a themed entertainment will really try and tap into. And sidelines is so important, and that's that's kind of. When we work on something like Jumanji, we worked um, originally on just sketch, so it's basically napkin sketches of layouts. And we have ideas about where the side lines are, so the Jaguar Shrine with the portal, the inversion over the top, and then what we'll do is 3D model all of that, look at all those side lines again, have what it looks like from outside the park, because um, there's certain side lines all the way to Cobra as well, in the other side, we want to make sure we've maybe captured all, all those ones in there. Um, and then when it comes to things like photo ops, we are living in a generation now where social media is kind of such a big part. And it, basically it's, it's free marketing. If you can ensure, if people who really enjoy their day, they will want to take a picture of it, they'll want to have those moments, they'll post it on their socials, their friends will see it, and they'll want to come to the park. So we want to provide as many of those opportunities as possible. So you will see a lot more of those, especially in some of my designs coming through across basically nearly every attraction that I've been working on. Thank you. And just ahead. Um, I want to go down the unexpected challenges route um, with the Curse of Alton Manor. Were there any that impacted the end result or anything that you had to work around? I'm trying to think now. It was a really fast turnaround project. Really fast. Like, like I said, I started it in um, probably April of 2022. Um, I didn't have long to have to get it um, all designed and through. Probably only had six weeks to design most of the attraction. Um, we then had, I'd say, I think it was six months from the day we shut it in September 6th all the way through to the opening day, which for a turnaround of a dark ride attraction, I think is absolutely insane. And we knew we had Valhalla up the road as well. It was also taking a bit of time to, to make, and we were being quite competitive with it. Um, I think we did it a lot quicker. Um, <laughs> um, 
But the biggest challenge um, I think we faced at the time, and allow me to tap onto it, was that trommel tunnel. Um, it hadn't been working for a long time, but it is such a great effect. And still today, when you ride it and you hear like other guests that aren't enthusiastic, they just go wow by that. And we, the budget we have to work with as well meant that it was a tough decision. Do we keep it and sacrifice the budget on something else, or do we go and keep this effect? And I think we unanim unanimously, regardless of that research, said, we are keeping that trommel tunnel and we wanted to amplify it, added all the new bits on, added the new theming uh, and new UV effects to it as well. So I'd, I'd say that was probably the biggest, biggest challenge, sometimes those decisions and also um, getting some of those older pieces that we you know just work so well back to life. More hands up here. I'm just wondering if you're certainly to ask what, what it was that made you become an enthusiast in the first place. Um, I was, I don't know, I started really, really young going to Disney World and Big Thunder Mountain for me was just something I absolutely loved and as an attraction. I know even John Wardley's, that's one of his favourite attractions as well. Um, I had a real interest in trains as well, and I find that was so it was just basically trains and roller coasters just on tracks that go upside down do all the other things. So it kind of in tandem kind of joined through as a thing I got interested in. And like I said, roller coaster tycoon, all that, as soon as that came out and gave me the opportunity to have a, a computer game that's creative, just drove that and then things like that. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, when theming your rides, what do you think makes them so immersive? Because they're like, every time I go on the rides, I just see new things every time, but what makes you so immersive and unique? That's a tricky question. Because, um, I mean, there's loads of immersive rides out there. And the word immersive is something that gets thrown around quite a lot uh, about. And, I've, I've been to experiences that use the word immersive and I can walk through there and say throwing some projections on the wall is not immersive to me. Um, it, it, I, <laughs> um, so I, I would say immersion is, is basically all the senses. You've got to be tapping into all of them and so we were adamant we did with all to manner, whether you feel it, see it, smell it, you name it. You, you're having to tap into all of those elements and it's trying not to break the illusion of putting a guest somewhere where they're, they're not meant to be. So if there's some kind of a real world element uh, within that space, how can we hide it and make sure that you are in Alton Manor, as an example? And that was really key. Um, things like trying to do fire extinguishers, how do we put those where they're safe? You've done, how do you do it with fire signs and make sure they're in incorporating, you don't break the magic. I think that is all about how we that's what, for a guest, makes it immersive. You don't lose the fact that you're actually not there. Awesome, thanks. Stay with it. Um, I just wondered, what do you take your inspiration from when you're coming up with your ideas for your parks? And do you ever look at other parks for inspiration to take from? So, as an enthusiast, I like to collect my creds and I like to travel, so I definitely travel around the world and go and get lots of um, inspiration from others. Um, inspiration doesn't just come from theme parks though, uh, film is a big one. Um, there's all sorts of places you can get it from. We, as a mode imagine making, we have a, a point of not just going to theme parks to try and get inspiration, we'll go to art exhibitions, we'll go do things that are so random, but you can find something in there. So another bit about Alton Manor was we went to the oldest um, toy museum in London, which was had a room up in the attic which was full of dolls, and it was the most terrifying thing I think I've ever seen. Um, and that, we just thought, that's great, make that, that, make that a scene. And so sometimes you can get inspiration from the most strangest of places, but those type of moments, when they make you feel something, you go, we want all our guests to have that moment as well. So we bring that into some of our attractions for it. Thank you very much.
question from staff over here. Mm -hmm. Do you ever help out like making the merch and like, designing them? So, as a team, we work really closely together when it comes to things like the merchandising. Like Larry said, the marketing, we're all working really like, collaboratively and hand in hand on this stuff. <laughs> and so, when we're working through the merchandise, um, those type of things have massive long lead times on them to be ordered. So, we are sharing the theme book, and for anyone who doesn't know what the theme book is, uh, that's basically the design document, that's what we call it, and it has everything from every scene to the lighting, the scripting, you name it, it has everything in there. And we share that with the um, merchandising team and they will go away, they'll come up with some of their own ideas and they'll bring them back and we'll throw in some of our ideas as well um, to, to bring it to life. So yeah, it's really collaborative uh, for it. Hi, um, I think from, from an external perspective it feels like recently there's been a bit of a change in Merlin, perhaps um, been a bit more generous with budgets and, and maybe even crave freedom for you guys as well. Um, could you sort of reflect on whether that's an accurate impression or, or how the company itself has, has changed over the seven years with them? I think as a business, Merlin is looking to really drive the attractions now. Um, and I think we've, as we all know, we've been through some tricky periods of time uh, through COVID where for a business it's very difficult to say whether or not to invest in, in certain things. Um, but I know from my portfolio and the current lineup of projects I've got on, I have got a lot on, in, in, um, on the horizon um, coming. And, <laughs> and yeah, I, would, I would say yes, there's, there's a lot more um, in the pipeline and from Merlin to Bio, I am very excited by especially having um, Scott O'Neill at the helm of all of this as well. Thanks, John. I don't know if you've written some rides like Symbolica or Fly, but they are like the most immersive like attractions. How can like you improve on the things that are coming to make them as immersive as that? or on even the budget to make it like that good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hold the purse strings. <laughs> um, I mean I've been on fly, I mean it's, it's an incredible attraction. Very different business set up set up a model with Fantasia Land being a uh, private family run business versus Merlin, big big corporate entity. Um, we go out there, we go look at these things, we see what they're doing um, and what they're we're tapping into. And kind of make, backing onto the previous question, um, I think the creative team at Merlin Management Agent, we, we're given a lot more license now to kind of be vocal about stuff and say what we think is going to really turn the dial for our guests. And if that means we have to spend a bit more money, we will fight for that. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, and we really love all that stuff. Um, and I think that's why it's really tricky as well for us as a creative team, because like, like you guys, we see stuff around, and we, really, and we as a creative, we really want to put everything into it. Of course, there are limitations of budgets we have to work with, and there's many, many reasons uh, for that. But um, when I see a dark space in the ride, -off, yes, I do want to make more of it. Um, and I hear you, but I do have to work within certain constraints. I wish life was like Planet Coaster, and I have a limited budget, and I can do everything, but um, I have to be as creative as possible to make those experiences uh, really kind of sing uh, when we're working on them as well. This is the first time I saw. As a storyteller, do you have a dream story that you would love to portray within a ride one day but haven't yet got the chance to? I'm going to say yes. I'm, I'm constantly coming up with ideas, um, whether that's if music's inspired that or something else. I can't say what, because who knows, I could be working on it right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of storytelling. That's what our attractions are all about. That's what our job is. As Larry says, we're entertainers and we're here to entertain our guests by telling through those stories as well. And I think it's really important to know that like storytelling and the reason you'll keep hearing it from Merlin is that stories was probably the first thing that 
human mankind was doing, whether it was cavemen painting on walls, telling the stories of time, something will never go away. Uh, and just how we deliver that, I think we'll just keep getting more interesting, more advanced as technology advances as well. Cheers, thank you. You mentioned um, not having to hold the purse strings and the budgets, but how close or how over was the budget for the Press of Albert Manor? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to answer that question based on just... So as you go around the uh, a gloomy wood area, you'll see certain names up on the, the walls. And I know quite a few of those little Easter eggs people will um, be looking out for. And I know there's a few on there people haven't quite got right just yet. So, um, so for instance, there's one that's um, Taylor and Millington. And I don't think anyone's worked out that they're actually the project managers on this. And I have to work really closely with those guys. They are amazing. Um, Cobbett, Yvette and David, they're working with me on Nemesis at the moment and they have to keep me in check, essentially, when it comes to spending too much money. Um, like I said, I want to constantly be um, splashing out and really going to town with a lot of the creative. Um, Dave and Yvette keep me in line on a lot of this stuff. I don't get to see the final numbers on these things. Um, I just get told if I've gone over budget um, on it. Uh, I didn't on this one. Um, but, yeah. The load of hands over there just popped up. <laughs> so, you've uh, had some really great questions, but now the most important. What's your credit count? <laughs> um, I updated the other day, I think it's 218. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I don't count discos, and Steeplechase uh, Chase is three. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What about Nash? Oh. Nash is two. Yeah. There's some more questions over there. Of course, like, um, never to speak, like, we've done stuff, and it looks amazing. Like, so far, it's beautiful, right? Like, what, like, what are your thoughts on, like, the new track station work going on, like, the red black track work? Like, what, like, is your thoughts on it? Like, it's amazing. So. Thank you. I mean, I can't say too much about Nemesis. Um, like I said, I'm sure the phalanx are probably listening in the book to room. Um, but yeah, everything's under control, is all I can say. <laughs> Looking back at what you've done so far, what would you say is your proudest moment in your career and why, or is it something still yet to come? My proudest moment, there's a few different attractions that I'm really proud of. Um, I think Dragon Slayer at uh, Warwick Castle was one of my favourites to work on. Not a roller coaster, not a ride. I never thought I'd be saying that because I didn't think I was actually that passionate about the more show side of things. I think the reason why I'm kind of so happy about that one was we were told it would it couldn't be done. You could not projection map onto Warwick Castle with the amount of walls we were trying to cover for the budgets we were trying to deliver. And I find the Warwick team are absolutely incredibly passionate about their attraction and about history and the castle. And we worked really closely together, Merlin Matchmaking and Warwick, to bring that show to life. And the challenge with any type of show that's projection mapping like Castle at Night in the middle of summer is you can't work on it during the day. You're having to work crazy hours overnight. So we had an operations team working throughout the day who were then coming back in at midnight and working until five o'clock in the morning. And we were all up on the, the kind of the, the, the balconies, adding, building the lights, all of us kind of kind of banded together, regardless of what job you were doing, putting this show on for the first time, and when it all came together, I, that was just a really magical moment for all of us, I think everyone was just so happy to see we, we did it uh, for that. So that for me was probably one of my favourites. I think my second one is Curse Alter Manor. Um, I put my stamp on that attraction, I think. Um, I was able to do so much, and I got given a lot of creative freedom that normally I probably wouldn't normally get to do on that and add in there a lot of the stuff that I think 
I wanted to, I would want to see as, as an enthusiast, what you guys would like to see, um, but also make something that is a homegrown story and add that into Alton. I've always wanted to build an attraction at Alton Towers and obviously my first one was an IP one with Gangster Granny and I got to work with David which was, was amazing. But then to write a story, work with an amazing team to bring that to life, that for me was such a, an amazing moment. See it open and see it have a good reception as well. Um, so when Curse opened, we had a rumour that you might be one of the actors in the Doll's House. I am not. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been doing voice for Jumanji the Adventure, so if you're ever on that in Gardland, you'll hear my voice straight in Jumanji just at the end. Um, but in Natural House, that is the majority of the AV team. Um, filming that. I wasn't able to be there on that particular day. I would have been, but um, I was too busy on another project at the time. So, sadly, I don't make an appearance, other than my name on the board at the front. Okay. Yeah. Second question. So, uh, <laughs> you reused a, lot, a few bits from Duel, yeah, so you've got the book posted in the shop, etc. Have you kept anything? I never actually got to keep anything from the attraction. Um, not even one of the old guns I didn't even get to keep. So, um, where are the guns? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> um, but no, there's a few bits. We recycled so much. Even stuff that you might think, oh, I didn't see that in the attraction. I mean, um, if you remember the caretaker that used to be by the, the hearse, that used to kind of beckon you in, um, we actually stripped him, used all his clothes, and they're on the washing line as you go into the scene with the, the chalkboard and stuff. So we, we recycled a lot of stuff, but it might just be seen in a totally different way than you've ever seen it um, used before. Well. Thank you. If it was solely up to you, what attraction would you bring to Alton Towers? I don't think I can answer that question because I'm, my remit now involves actually getting involved in a lot of the strategic planning for the attractions. So I, I'm really passionate about adding my opinions to there, so, and some of those might be happening. So I can't say too much, unfortunately. Um, again, there's big things on the horizon. <laughs> More hands over here. Uh, thank you. Um, we've heard a lot about stories, uh, the curse, uh, Nemesis, and I think they're both amazing examples. And Nemesis, the retrack, and, and all the new work hasn't even finished yet. Um, we compare that with Project Exodus, and you yourself today mentioned um, curse and timings with Valhalla. Do you think there is a time and a place for parks and attractions to have that uh, goal setting and record breaking aspects of either time or height or speed, as well as story in the same instance, or do you think they're separate? And if they're that combined aspect, have we just not seen enough about Project Exodus just yet? Because it, it hasn't had the same amount of uh, attention seemingly from the outside that Nemesis and Curse have had. Big question. Um, so I can't talk too much about Project Exodus. Um, it's the tallest in the UK, so it's getting that record piece. I can't talk any more about what else part of that project to really go deep into that question. But in essence, if we're saying that is a world where you can have both storytelling and record breaking, absolutely, I think you can do both. I think for me, I would love to do that because. At the end of the day, we are having to appeal to the general public. They are very difficult. There's so many attractions out there now that can take away uh, from places like theme parks. Um, festivals, for instance, if you have um, a, a set amount of money that year to spend and all your friends are going to Glastonbury Festival, that's where they're all going to go and that's where they might choose to spend their money. So we need to be making sure that our attra attractions are making those headlines and also being great experiences that you want to come back and do them again. So I think in the world of 
um, what I have to do. I think both is definitely, when you combine them, definitely the place we need to be um, kind of targeting to really drive that visitation to, to the results. Thank you. And just down over here. Sorry, where am I looking? Manner. Is there any other Easter eggs that people didn't really notice? I think the other one, um, I don't know, if someone might have spied them, I'm not sure, is as you, everyone's been on the ride, I assume, I'm not spoiling this for anyone. Um, so as you go through the trauma tunnel, you will see uh, the figure of Emily, and you get the shadow gag of the demon that comes up from behind her. That's what we call her kind of playroom. Um, you'll see the miniature version of the marionette theatre with her family that she's made, a perfect family. And on the walls, there's four uh, images of childlike um, stories. So each one of those is a reference to the scenes that she's kind of playing uh, with you. So uh, the first one is Pinocchio. So you'll see Pinocchio in one of the, the frames. That is referencing the marionette theatre scene. There is uh, Cinderella, um, so that's obviously the whole reference to the 12 o'clock striking midnight uh, piece. Um, there is Alice in Wonderland with the drink me bottle, so that the idea of being shrunk down. Um, and there's one more, Hansel and Gretel, and the idea of being pushed through the fireplace, and that's the scene with the trauma scene. So that, if you look on the walls behind it, you'll see those little references uh, on there. I don't think anyone's picked up on yet. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. I've visited so many parks around the world. What's been your favourite dark ride or one that's inspired you the most? My favourite dark ride, kind of controversial with some people, is Dinosaur Animal Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan. I mean, I love dinosaurs. I love the ride system. I just think the way it kind of reacts and that's what I always wanted to try and capture within Jumanji the Adventure. I know it's a totally different ride system, um, but the way the dinosaurs can come from this side, the car lurches as if it's got a persona and a character, and I just think that's absolute genius. Um, the immersion in it, and I was terrified as a kid when I went on there, every time that Carnotaurus kind of came, came out. Um, but that to me was my kind of gold star, and I'll be good at the day at least. Brilliant ride, thank you. <laughs> Question? Cool. Outside of anything male related, what are you most looking forward to in the industry? What am I most looking forward to in the industry? Um, it's an interesting one because I feel like new rides and attraction types slowed down uh, quite a lot. We went through a phase, I feel like, in the 90s and the early noughties where there was constantly something new and innovative. And I think that those, those type of attractions were not quite there anymore, like the world's first vertical drop roller coaster. Most stuff has been done now. Um, what I get most excited about is seeing um, the manufacturer designers really pushing boundaries with things like the layouts, designers working with theming and really bringing that stuff to life. So when I see like when, what RMC were doing, that, that blew me away at the time and I get really excited about seeing how they, they do that and we take inspiration from some of those ideas. When we look at things like Rise of Resistance uh, at Disney, I mean incredible dark ride, uh, lots of money being spent on that and again when when some of those kind of pieces come together, that's, I just think that's absolutely incredible. Now, is there something in the future I'm looking forward to? I, I, there's loads of stuff going on in the industry. Problem is, we're all trying to be quite quiet because it's a big competition. Um, so I'm sure there's other stuff out there that I don't know of that I would be very excited about seeing, but as an industry, it's very kind of um, quite quiet. All right, three more questions. Thank you. You seem very passionate and uh, you know motivated with the work that you do. 
but there must be a lot of pressure on your shoulders when you're releasing new projects, especially from the enthusiast community like this. Uh, how much does that affect the work that you put out, and do you let it affect the overall idea? It, it can be really challenging at times because it's, it's like art, so it's subjective. Not everyone will enjoy everything that I will work with the team and put out there, um, but we try to make sure we are capturing everyone. Um, I think it's very difficult when, for instance, we will be looking at, like Larry said, we'll be checking social media to see what those responses are um, to, to some of this. And it's great when we hear people really enjoy it. We know this don't always. But I think the hardest thing is sometimes we've got to remember that some things we design are for the general public and they are, we are, we are in here probably the 1% in a lot of this. My motto in this all is, if we can make it that you guys love it, pretty sure the general public is going to love it as well. So that's what I try and um, work for. In terms of lighting, when it comes to like um, shows and rides, how do you incorporate that during the planning process? It, it's different on every project. It just depends on what the project is. Um, so, for instance, with something like Warwick Castle's Dragon Slayer, that's very obviously AV heavy projections, content. So, we'll probably early stages work with um, an AV partner on something. We'll see what their portfolio is like, see what they've. Um, creating the past, do they have um, ideas that they've done this before? With something like Alter Manor, we might work uh, more local, like localised in house. We might bring in something some other people do, some elements. So every project's very different. I don't personally get heavily involved in specifying the hardware. Um, I'm normally there saying what kind of the effect I want to try and achieve, and then work alongside the teams to help bring those effects um, to life. All right, and last question, please. I'm leaving on to you, John, to decide. <laughs> I'll go for this guy, yeah. <laughs> Hi, John. Um, I love the score to Bolton Man. Um, I think Armour Score done a great job with it. Um, did you have much creative, like, uh, did you have much? influence with like the creative process or um, did you kind of just give them creative freedom and also who is the narrator to Rolton Manor because there's a lot of debate online as to who it actually is. So when it comes to development of things like music for our attractions Though the briefs that they get sent out are created by the creative team and the matchmaking. So we will write out for every single scene uh, what we're looking for. We worked with um, Conductor, um, an AV company, on, on that attraction. And they worked with IMA Score and myself to bring that together. Um, they will, IMA Score are amazing because what they do is they create demo tracks for us, which is normally like 30 second kind of a little demo of what it is. We've been through, we went through so many with Ultimana. I knew exactly what I wanted it to sound like, um, and trying to convey that can be really, really challenging. Um, the tone of it, the brief ended up being, was Phantom Manor at Disneyland Paris, combined with the Woman in Black uh, musical uh, score from the soundtrack as well. And it was kind of pieced those together whilst a adding in the whole kind of toy um, dollhouse kind of uh, piece in there. And when those three came together, we then just kept building it and building it. And when you listen to the track, when you stand in that queue line, um, you'll actually see what it does is it tells the story through music as well. And that's something you'll see in a lot of my attractions is that I'm really passionate that in the actual main, we call it the BGM, the background music, you normally do a 20 to 30 minute loop, you'll hear um, a piece of music that's been sync, synced up that you could literally play whilst you're riding the ride. Because again, it's telling that story through music that we don't always do that. We did it on Jumanji, um, where actually we wrote a piece of music that when you're in the stationery, you can hear, it actually syncs up with the whole ride experience. Um, yes, we don't have onboard audio, I would absolutely love, would love to have done that, because it would have really amplified the experience. 
Um, but yeah, we have massive involvement with all that. Anything that is creative has to come through the team. And then to your last point, so Conductor is founded by Peakliff and the voice is Peakliff that's been manipulated a little bit um, on there as well. Thank you. And there we go then, so a big round of applause for John Clark. We're so grateful you know, to get, in, I guess, an insider knowledge of the creative process. So once again, you know, we are so grateful. So thank you so much. So uh, we weren't too mean to you, were we? No, nothing too too bad. <laughs> yeah, Excellent. Sort of, okay. Well, guys, please do hang around. We've got an exciting evening ahead. Who's ready to party? <laughs> so the bar is open till 12 a.m. So no uh, raves in the car park this year, please. <laughs> Um, I just want to say a couple of thank yous before I hand over to the DJ Alex tonight. Um, I just want to thank the rest of the AS and TT team. Um, I'm sure you'll agree they've done a fab job. And again, thank you guys for myself. Um, I couldn't do this without you. So, you know, thank you again. Round of applause. I also just want to thank Adam and Alex from uh, On Event Co again for putting on quite the show tonight um, and only the best for John, so um, thank you again. So, yeah. <laughs> so if you've had a good day today, please do share on socials. It makes it all worthwhile when we get some great feedback, uh, so do hashtag, do smash that share button um, and we'll share the best responses again. And again, I'm just so grateful again for everyone um, coming and then you know, we're going to hopefully make this an annual occasion now. It's certainly kind of my favourite event of the year. Um, but we've got more to look forward to. So we're going to be announcing a fourth event quite soon for September the 16th. We're then back here for uh, Scare Amazing um, in October. And we're also going to be hosting Towers Times Christmas Cracker, uh, the first Christmas event here. So we'll wait for the lineup and see how that goes. But yeah, hope to see you there. Uh, and that's everything from me. So do enjoy the evening. Um, and again, have a great time. Thank you. Woo!